music, literature, drama, the whole culture, particularly the religion of all the people of Asia can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. India, Japan, China, just to name a few, even Afro-American history can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. I know it sounds strange to you, but the world owes a debt to the Africans of Asia. In the following presentation, you'll find out exactly why. Just give me a few seconds. Your ancestors never intended to let you down. In this book, called The Gods of Northern Buddhism, we find a name, the Asian name of the supreme deity of the universe. His name is Sambo. They say when nothing else was, Sambo was the name of the god of the universe to the people of Asia. And there are many places that carry this name. This is a depiction of Sambo. This is not an African statue. This is from Asia. And many places in Asia are called Sambo Judasia, the land of the descendants of Sambo. Various spellings of the word and the name Sambo can be found throughout Asia. Negas, the divine people of Buddhism. This is a second century depiction of Gautama the Buddha being given his first bath by the divine people of Buddhism called Negas, a tribe in Asia called Negas, the divine people of all the people of Asia, symbolized throughout Asia by the serpent or the dragon. That is their symbol. The Nega means serpent or dragon, the snake found at the entrance of every temple. The Nega on the roads, on the hills, in the caves, the symbol of the Asiatic black man, the tribe called the Negas, the divine people. There are cities also throughout Asia that carries this particular name, Nega. It can be seen at all ceremonies dealing with worship of God. From the Nile Valley to the Indus Valley, on tombstones, a symbol of immortality because of the serpent's ability to change his skin is a sign of never dying and is used throughout the planet Earth, North, South America, Egypt, Asia, Africa, throughout the world. It's the symbol of life after death, the nega, the serpent. In all ancient cultures, in all ancient religions, the serpent is the symbol the nega, the symbol of divinity, of God. The original inhabitants of Southeast Asia was called the Mons, an African tribe. In order to confirm what these people look like, you have to go to the archaeological finds from Davarati, a French uh, archaeological research finding confirming the original inhabitants. There's no depictions uh, preceding these of the original inhabitants of Southeast Asia. The people, the descendants of Sambo, the Asiatic black man. The seven serpents or seven rays or the negas surrounding his head represent the cosmic forces that afford him protection. He is a divine representation of cosmic forces and those seven serpents represent his divine mission. He does not come of his own. He's a manifestation of the cosmos. The serpents or the nega represent cosmic forces which is at his command, which represent him as a divinity. He is the manifestation of the universe. That is the symbol of those serpents you see surrounding his head. In essence, the seven serpents are cosmological, dealing with astrology, it's astrological representations of those forces of the cosmos that he represents. He is a universal monarch, a universal king, which he manifests and he shows evidence of. The black man of Asia, the original inhabitants of Asia. He is a human being of flesh and blood. He comes as a teacher, as a manifestation of God. His teachings are called the Dhamma. He is called the Buddha, the intelligent one, the one who has achieved intelligence, or the genie, the conqueror. He comes 
to explain the laws of the universe. He comes to confirm that there is, in fact, life after death. When the Buddha appears, he appears as a preacher, and he preaches the Dharma. That existence is a continual cycle of death and rebirth, and that each person's position and well-being in life is determined by his or her behavior in their previous lives. For example, good deeds may lead to rebirth as a wise and wealthy person or as a being in heaven, and a person's evil deed could lead to rebirth as a poor and sickly person, or even rebirth in hell. He preaches that you reap what you sow. A Buddha also teaches that it's possible to break out of this cycle and gain a kind of perfect peace and happiness by practicing righteousness. They are manifestations of God. According to their prophecies, they promise to prove and make manifest through a Buddha or a Jina life after death before the end of this century. How can you teach a people to know God if he himself does not know God? If you try teaching a Christian that God is also a human being or manifests himself in the form of a human being or makes himself known through a human being, they will say that you're crazy, that you don't believe in God. Meanwhile, they admit that he is a mystery god who is unknown. They teach not to make any likenesses of him, yet they adorn their walls and churches with pictures, images, statues like human beings. They also say he is a spirit that cannot be seen. They cannot see him, yet they believe in him. In order to remove all doubt, the Buddha, the enlightened one, the intelligent one, the genie, the conqueror, decided to make manifest to the world irrefutable evidence. They wanted to prove to a people in the future the manifestation of God, that God manifests himself through human beings, through men. Now prophecy is irrefutable. A prophecy is a written confirmation of what will happen at a future date. These people, the black people of Asia, predicted or prophesized what they would do 2,500 years into the future. The prophecy states that he would send something from the past and join it with something from the future. Something from the material world and join it with something from the spiritual world. The union of both the past and the future worlds and the spiritual and the material worlds would be contained in the revelation of a secret mystic diagram called the Mandela of Two Parts. This is a depiction of the future Buddha who would make this manifest at a point before the end of this century. Now the scriptures of the world have all prophesied at the end of the age which we are now entering, the age of Aquarius, we shall see the revelation of that which is secret and the emergence into the light of day of that which has hitherto been concealed and veiled. This, our present age, is that time, the end of the cycle, the beginning of the new age. This book by Ivan Van Sertema raises the question of the African presence in early Asia. How did they get to Asia? This is the future Buddha. How did they get to Asia? They were called the Mons. And the wind and the rain in Asia is called the monsoon. This is the key to how they got to Asia. The monsoon wind in April blows from the southwest, and in October it blows from the northeast. The monsoon wind blows from Africa to Asia, and from Asia back to Africa. The wind from April to October blows from the southwest and from October to April it blows from the northeast. These two trade routes and routes that of travel is the direction of the Mons, the Africans of Asia. They went from Africa to Asia and from Asia to Africa 
and they were called the Mons, like the monsoon. Africa was called Hither India, which India, here I am, come hither, come here, where I am. And they would get on the ocean and get in the wind. This is where the phrase, get in the wind, come from, from your previous life. The Africans of Asia got to Asia by getting in the wind. This is confirmed from the first century the Greeks knew how they got to Asia, the wafting sailors. They call it the divine ship of salvation, the Mons, when they would arrive in Asia and when they would leave Asia. The Japanese badge of, uh, of nobility is called a Mon. The monsoon, the monastery, Mani, is identified with the black man of Asia. And the largest statues on the planet Earth located in Asia are depictions of the Buddha, the black man, the Gina. His hair confirms who he is. This is the largest statue in China and the largest statue on Earth depicting the black man. The oldest and largest manifestations of God, like this image of the Buddha in Thailand and Southeast Asia, are representations of the black Africans of Asia. There are no other statues or monuments of antiquity that precede them. They manifest themselves on Earth and prove life after death. This from Ceylon or Sri Lanka showing the Buddha, thousands of years old. They are the largest statues on earth represent, representing the black people of Asia or the black man of Asia, the one who comes back from the dead to prove immortality. They do it all the time in all the countries and they prophesied that they would do it before the end of this century. This is the largest statue in Sri Lanka, the largest statue in China, the largest statue in India, the largest monolithic statue on earth, the genie, the one who comes back from the dead carved in solid rock 70 feet high. The largest monolithic statue on earth is the black man and it is not in Africa but it is in Asia. The Asiatic black man, the manifestation of God who comes back to preach and explain the doctrine of immortality, how to escape the fires of hell. That is his sole purpose. To attack him is to attack the cosmic forces of God. He sits in Western style because he will be born in the West. The people who he, who he will be born among are called the niggas. This is the future Buddha, the one who is to come prove with irrefutable evidence for those with intelligence that there is no death, that life is eternal. And this evidence of eternal life is put in place by their control after death of the cosmic forces. This is a cave in India showing the one who is to come in the future. All of these statues and monuments are thousands and thousands of years old. The future Buddha, sitting down in Western style. He is known by many names in many religions. To the Christian, he's the Christ. To the Muslims, the Mahdi, the Messiah, the Avatar, Maruku, Maruk Bull. To the Koreans, the Buddha, the Genie. All different names for the same individual who is to appear now at the end of the age, the beginning of the new cycle. He is also called Maitreya, the future Buddha. In this book, Maitreya, the future Buddha, you can find the prophecy of his return in 2,500 years. This prophecy identifies the time when he is to appear. It states that he will appear in 2,500 years in a tripartite year in the first year of a cycle. He will descend to be reborn, and he will produce a city of silver by transformation. He will change a city, which will serve as evidence of who he is. He must produce a city by transformation. The Buddha was born in 560 BC and died in 480 BC. He received enlightenment at the age of 35, which is 525 BC.
This prophecy had to have been made between 525 B.C. and 480 B.C. If you project 2,500 years into the future, it will come between 1975 and the year 2020. 30, 60, and 90 are tripartite years. 1930, 1960 is gone. The only tripartite year left is 1990. The first year of a cycle is 1991. In 1991, the future Buddha is to appear. 1991. In Angkor, in Southeast Asia, we find the city of the future Buddha. Hidden from the outside world for thousands of years and discovered by the French in 1858. It was hidden in the jungle by fig trees. This is the city designated to confirm the future Buddha. This city was hidden because of the banyan tree, a tree that starts in the sky. Birds drop their seeds from the sky on the leaves of existing trees. The branches spread out horizontally and then grows down, covering everything beneath it. The tree is worshipped throughout Asia. It's called the tree of God. It is the only tree that starts in the sky and comes down. Here you see it written that one tree covered 20,000 people. It is the most unusual tree on earth. It's the fig tree, the banyan tree, the, the, the tree that hid a 36 mile wide city in the jungle for thousands of years. This is the tree of God. Here it is explained that the tree uh, spreads indefinitely and it is not known to die. It's the tree of immortality. It is the most famous tree in Asia, the banyan tree tree of God. This is an artist's depiction of the city of the future Buddha, a city of stone, a stone Bible of the religious teachings of the Africans of Asia. This is the entrance to the temple called Angkor Thom, an eight mile perimeter covers the city. This picture shows you how the tree starts in the sky and the roots come down covering that face which you see. Those are roots from the tree which started in the sky covering the face of, on a tower. There are 50 towers in this city with faces of the future Buddha. This is a close up on the future Buddha's face with the roots which started in the sky and came down to cover it. The fig tree. This is a a picture of that particular city, a map showing you a, the 36 mile, a mile uh, perimeter. And there's a seven mile perimeter around this city of Ankatan. This is the city which we will focus on, the Bayonne, the central temple of Ankatan. This city is viewed as a Bible, a sermon in stone. As you can see, it was built by men to confirm and serve as evidence, irrefutable evidence, of the future Buddha. That the Africans of Asia who built this here, they knew and wrote the future before it happened. And that the future Buddha would use these stone images of himself, these 50 stone face towers, skyscrapers in the sky, stone monuments, a Bible on the walls to confirm his identity, hidden in the jungle for thousands of years. Even though the city was sacked of its riches when it was discovered by the French, it still bears mute testimony to the teachings of the black people, the Africans of Asia. These stone face monuments are depictions of the one to come. There are 50 towers telling you that this one, the future Buddha, who you see here, would be in a tower. The 50 towers representing the 50 states of the United States before they were ever discovered. The lions on the outside also bear testimony since there are no lions in Asia. The lions came from Africa. These are African lions. This map shows you all the animals of Asia. The lion is not an indigenous animal, the tiger is. The symbol China, one of the major symbols. It's the symbol of the Asia society for all the people of Asia, the lion, testimony to the influence of the Africans of Asia. This book on sculpture from Thailand and Cambodia shows you some of the bronze and stone sculpture stolen and put in private collections from this city of the future Buddha. 
These were inside the temples and taken out by the colonial powers and put in private collections for private exhibits, the Africans of Asia. Let me clarify the way of the gods in all cultures. Number one, they write the future before it happens in stone. Then they let the future happen. Then they send one back from the dead who explains it and reveals that which they wrote. This constitutes the execution of judgment. Now, this shows you that there are in fact 50 states in the United States and there were 50 towers in this city. The future Buddha is to appear in a tower in the United States on the seventh terrace. There are seven levels above his head. That's the esoteric teaching. On the walls of this is the story of the people whom this individual, the future Buddha, would appear among. Here we show the Europeans coming in to Africa. We see they have weapons on their shoulders. This is on the walls in this city. We see the African with his bow and arrow going to meet the European on the field of battle. We see the African with his elephants and his weapons of war going to meet the aggressor coming into his country. Here we see the two armies clashing on one single panel on the southern wall at the temple of the Bayonne in this city. The African army on the left, the European army on the right, and they clash in the center of this stone carving of the European invasion of Africa as the Europeans load the African arms to the bottom of the ship and take off to America, onward to America. The middle passage where the Africans are thrown overboard, the entire history or book of revelation or unveiling is shown in this city of the kidnapping of Africans from Africa. This city is a book of revelation, an apocalypse in stone. It is discovered by the one they call Maruk, Maruk Bull, the future Buddha. He discovers and unveils the true meaning of this city. This is in the religious teachings of the people of Asia. He uses a city carved in stone, the true book of revelation, the apocalypse, the book of revelation, which will be discovered and explained. And we will now take you to the true history of the United States of America and their slaves to identify the truth carved in stone thousands of years before it happens about these people, the Africans of America. This document, this is the true document of the slave trade from Great Britain or the British House of Commons. It consists of certified eyewitness reports of the satanic atrocities of slavery. The fact that it was a conspiracy is evident by the pattern of punishment and the systematic step-by-step -step method in which it was applied for over 400 years. It is an orgy in the infliction of pain, the infliction of pain on innocent people with eyewitness step-by-step -step reports on what they was supposed to do and what they intended to do to these people who they identified in their document as an injured humanity. They meant to injure these people and this was their intent. They referred to them as injured humanity. Christians did this to the children of Africa. The science that was used on these innocent people were based on universal cosmic laws. As you see here, there are laws that are above all man-made laws. They're the laws of the God. They're the laws of the universe, and they govern all humanity. The two laws which we will focus on right now is called the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, and the law of polarity, the relationships between opposites. Both of these laws pervade all things in the universe, and this was the focus of the slave trade. We all know about crack. If a woman takes crack, we now know that that same addiction will be born into her babies. Crack addiction 
in the mother is born into the child. This natural law, the law of rebirth, the law of karma, the law of cause and effect was used on the slave in a corrupted method, in a corrupted manner. The primary objective was to induce the fear of God into the slave. Fear is associated with God. If you fear someone, that person in your subconscious is viewed as God. And fear is something that you always have the expectation of once it's induced in you. So the, the primary objective to get the re desired results would be the creation of a race of people that would worship the European race subconsciously as God. That's the objective. Pain and fear, the infliction of which would cause the slave subconsciously to worship the European as God. And this was the tools that they would use, the tools of instruction, their, their, their kit for a step-by-step -step infliction of pain on the innocent slave so that the slave's children would eventually worship the European as God in their subconscious but never consciously know what they were doing. This is one of the greatest or the greatest crime ever committed by human beings, so-called human beings, against human beings. The infliction of fear and terror babies for hundreds of years and images, false images of God put before the babies to worship so a race of people can be falsely worshipped as God. The slave masters used science. They knew that if they could put fear in the minds of the slave, that slave, the children of those slaves would be reborn with that fear in them. And that fear would affect what they see and what they hear. This was science used on the slave. If they put those images and affected the mind, it would affect what they see, what they hear, and exactly what they do. It was a science of the mind that was used on the slave. Images, the Bible, and the illiterate. Images are the Bible of those without education. You read the Bible, but the images are collected in your mind and the images stay in your mind but what you read may go away this is carved on the walls in this city thousands of years ago by the black man of Asia to tell the story of the apocalypse a book that would be revealed by this individual whose name you will find out in a short while he is the future Buddha the one who unveils the book of Revelation in a stone city, bringing the past and the future together. Now that we understand the science used to get the desired results of the false worship of the European as God by a group of slaves and their descendants forever and ever if possible, now let's continue with the story. Once again on the stone walls we see the African and the Europeans in combat, fighting to prevent their people from going into slavery. To confirm this is an African people, on the right you see the djembe, a very popular African drum, and on the left you see the African talking drum. Not the European, not the Asian, but the African talking drum carved on the walls to show that this was an African people who were carried off as captives. Here it is on one panel with three levels. The war that took place in Africa, thousands of years before it happened, carved in stone, bearing mute testimony to what really happened. Here is how the European artists of that time interpreted that event with his pen. The same event in the British Commonwealth, testifying to what they said that they did at that time to the black man. Here, the testimony from a, from a rock in this hidden city tells exactly what happened, which was known by the gods. A testimony in silence from a stone, from a paper in the British House of Commons. I just interpret what they said that they did with their pen. Here, the slaves are shuttled out small boats to the mothership. The artist depiction at that time 
with their pen interpreting what the mothership looked like. The ship that brought the slaves from Africa to America is now interpreted by the rock of Southeast Asia. This is from Barubado. The ship of salvation is the same ship that comes to pick up the slave and the same ship that brought the slave into slavery, packed like sardines, according to the pen of this European who knew what he saw. He saw the slaves, according to this pen from this artist of European extraction, being packed into the ships in the bottom of the ship. This is what they say they did. The stone now speaks how the African fought a losing battle with the European and his gun and then were taken to the shore and loaded and packed on ships in the bottom of the ship, the stone, in silence. Speaks loud and clear with the Europeans on their head with their weapons prepared to kill. Testimony from Iraq. The European says the slaves were in cramped quarters below the deck. They know what they did. If you compare the cramped quarters from the European pen and from the stone monuments of the gods, you will see they both speak with accuracy. The black man was cramped on the bottom of the ship according to the stone monument of the gods and the silence of the European pen bearing new testimony to that truth, which only applies onward to America. The fight did not end with the capture. Naturally, tribal groups fought all the way to the mothership. They came out on the ocean to the mothership in battle array, prepared to fight, boarding the mothership, going out in stone and on paper, going to reclaim their relatives. Here they are on board one of the ships where the slaves are, a mutiny. Tribal members coming to the mothership, continuing the fight on the water to get their captured relatives and tribes back. On paper and in stone. The same battle, the same event, the same thing testified by mute witnesses, slaves coming up from beneath the ship fighting for their freedom, according to the European pen and according to the rock of the Africans of Asia. The fight on board ship going out to meet the aggressor to bring back their relatives and friends who were captured. Naturally, after the European had won the battle, during the Middle Passage, when British inspectors would come, he would throw the Africans overboard to the crocodiles and the shark, according to his pen, and according to the stone. In this sacred city, hidden for thousands of years, the events of the Middle Passage is told with mute testimony in silence. In the loudest silence, with that bird, that phoenix on their ship, identifying who they are. They're the European, who threw the black man overboard. On the rock, and with the pen. Two opinions of the same event equal the same opinion of the Middle Passage. Naturally, the crocodiles had their feast on the black man where many, many millions died during the Middle Passage, according to both history books. Who were these founding fathers who did this to the Africans? According to their own pen, 
they were the worst kind of deranged ex-convicts which, which they had gotten out of their jails, shiploads of them, mass murderers, satanic worshippers, the worst deranged minds they could find, and their leader, this is his logo, Sir John Hawkins, this was his symbol, the chief slave master, the chief slave driver, the chief slave capture, this was his symbol, according to him, and this is according to the Africans of Asia in stone. Both tales, two people of the same story, reaching the same conclusion, one thousands of years before and one thousands of years after, bearing testimony to the wisdom and knowledge of the black man of Asia. Another story that was going on at the time was the mass murder of the American Indian, destruction of him, his civilization, his family, his tribal organization and his people for absolutely no reason at all, according to their pen, would agree. Here we see the confirmation of what they say in that document in the British Commonwealth about the families being separated at the crack of a whip. The father from the mother, the mother from the baby, and the relatives left crying, and the boatman holding the boat, anchoring it to shore. The European art speaks in silence, and so the stones of that sacred city that was buried in the jungle, showing the boatman on the left, the Africans being prepared to be taken off the boat at the crack of a whip. The stone speaks, the paper speaks, and they both sing in harmony while the boatman anchors them to shore according to the gods of Asia. Confirmed on stone on the left and paper on the right. The speaking stone. Naturally, the weak ones, the sickly ones, were left to die wherever they fell, with no help whatsoever. On to auction block. The history of the sale and marketing and capitalizing on human flesh is solely attributed to the European. The sale of the black families in America was the first big business of the United States. Here we see a black family on the auction block. The paper speaks, the auctioneer takes the bids, and the helpless, terrorized family stands up there in blind terror, waiting to see who will help separate them. And here we see the same identical scene in stone. The stone speaks loud, the pen of the European speaks loud, and they both sing together in perfect harmony. The truth so clear of a blind man could see. Confirmed in living color and on paper, the whip separating the families, the families being branded, particularly the woman, to identify who her new owner was, not her husband, but the European slave trader. They sold their own children that they had for the slave. The mulatto girl, Sarah. There's cards identifying the big businessman in the sale of human flesh. $1,200 for Negroes. Negroes for sale, according to these documents, the authentic official documents. There are no lies here. The paper speaks loud and clear. Valuable slaves for sale. Mulatris, mulatto, Sarah, Dennis, Fanny, mulatto, mulatto, blacks, mulattoes, Creoles. What kind of man is this that sells his own babies and anybody else's babies? Good God Almighty. Here we see he not only sold your baby and my baby, but he sold the flesh of his flesh and the bone of his bone. Imagine the unbridled license they inflicted on the black ones. The great divide of the black family, the separation, according to what they say that they did, separating the black woman from her baby. Here she is in the history books of America, giving away her baby to a people who she knew would commit every type of the worst crimes of passion with malice that the human mind could think of with unbridled license, according to their own words.
This is the history of the black woman and her babies in the United States of America. By their pen. By their own admission. And by the stones of the Africans of Asia. The black woman giving her baby away to a known beast who had already inflicted the same pain on her. In stone, speaking loud on paper, they both sing together the same song. The exploitation and degradation and crucifixion of the black people of America with unbridled license. A stone city in Asia buried in the jungle. The history of the black people that black woman was forced to go back to the plantation and give her love to the white woman, the slave master's baby. After she gave her baby away, they made her love his. Incredible. This is according to what they say they did. The passions, the worst passions of the human mind rage with unbridled license. They call us the extraordinary punishment, the infliction of which included malice and fury, according to their words, the voice of their paper. Some crimes they would not divulge. That was worse than that. Naturally, the slave attempted to run away, escape from slavery in the Underground Railroad. witness against them. The slave and stone running away and the worst thing, getting caught and brought back. And Angkor Wat in Southeast Asia coming back to face the infliction of pain. See, here's some freed slaves with the pen screaming loud, the woman and her baby being caught and taken back into slavery. Observe the fear in the child. This is their pen speaking to you. This is the power of their pen. In stone, the slaves being caught, who ran away, brought back and thrown down to a lower hell for lower punishment, being beaten, their tongues being pulled out, hung from trees, savagely beaten with bats, sticks, knives, they had 50 pound bricks, according to what they wrote, that they would crush them with. They would throw them in hot uh, sugarcane oil. They would pour hot lead on them. This is what they say they did in this document. And here it is, screaming from a stone, bearing mute witness to what they say that they did, confirming that. Here it is right here, on paper. You see, they would put 50 pound, 70 pound weights around their necks and crush them. Why? They tried to avoid pain. Here they are with the weights and the two Africans under the weights, the Afro-Americans being crushed. And they would let them stay there in pain. What manner of people is this? What kind of people is this? Here's a woman who knew she had to go back to slavery. She said, no, sir. She jumped out the window, confirming the effect of the slave master in inducing fear. Here's the meaning of fear in the dictionary. Let the wife see that she may fear the husband. Let her see the pain inflicted on her husband. He maketh the pen speak. The pen bears witness against him. Notice the entire family, the entire plantation looking on. The woman, the husband, as they beat the slaves. The babies, the wife, the family. This was the objective to inflict fear in the entire race. To put the fear of God in the entire race. They never did it without witnesses. Your woman beaten in the presence of her family. A whisper from the pen of the European slave master. He did it. He wrote it and he painted it. The runaway slave took all the pain. One of the primary objectives is to force the black woman to know that her new man was the white man, so he branded her. He made her loyal to him. 
He raped her. He made her carry his baby, then he invited other nations. He said he was a beast with two horns, North America and South America, the same crimes against the same people. Here we see how they divided the thoughts and beliefs of black people. On the left, we have, to say, for example, the Martin Luther King crew. On the right, the Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad crew. And they both are in conflict with each other. This sculpture is called Hirihara, or divided loyalty. But don't forget the runaway slave. His back bears witness to what he experienced during the entire slavery cycle. Pain inflicted on the black man. Who can argue with that? Who can deny that? And here it is, on paper, they identify and give you a definition of crucifixion, to torture with severe pain and anguish. That's the meaning of crucifixion. And they show the black man. And it's in the tradition of the people of Asia. This is the symbolic representation of crucifixion, of infliction of pain in every part of the body in Asia, in the traditions. The castration of the black man, the cutting off of his penis, the ultimate symbol of crucifixion in stone. A voice from the stone of Southeast Asia showed the black man in the uh, position of the cross with his penis castrated, the man below him with a knife, with pins throughout his body showing the severe pain. Him and the black woman were forced to suffer. They are the Christ in Asia. And this is how they did the Christ. In stone and in paper before slavery, they never put him on the cross. The pen and the brick and the rock in harmony. The crucifixion of the Christ. This is the true identity of Christ. Black people know very little about this or nothing at all. It's them that they should be worshiping themselves. And here it is. The pregnant women, they were singled out. The Mayflower Madam pimped them, made them sell and prostitute their body on ships and beat them half to death when they didn't bring back enough money. The Mayflower Madam, the white female. This is where the Mayflower Madam came from. They would grab that black baby and chase that family through the streets, beating the baby was the target. To inflict fear in the mother, made that fear reborn in the baby while they both watched the father hung according to their art from their hands their pen speaking loud and clear attacking foster homes with little black orphanage babies and beating them to death kicking them robbing them raping them beating them hanging them to your babies they did this according to their pen according to their hands and what they say their art their artists this is a true depiction of what they say they did who are you to argue with this? Who the hell are you arguing with? The science that the European knew was that if he inflicted fear in your babies, that fear would be reborn in their babies. So he inflicted fear in the woman and the children by hanging the father in their presence. So that fear, according to the law of rebirth, according to the law of karma, would be reborn in their babies. So they attacked homes with orphanages with little girls and stoned and beat them and raped them and killed them in front of each other so the word of fear could spread, the fear of God. False God, the white man, that's the law. The law, the law. No one can evade the law of cause and effect. Evil deed, evil consequence. Have crack is taken by a woman that crack baby will be born and have the same addiction. It's the law of rebirth. It's the law of cause and effect. The baby is reborn with fear. If fear is inflicted with the mother, it just has to be rekindled by an event in the life of that child. Look at these freed slaves and look at the fear in their eyes, even though there's no one there to harm them. It's reborn in their faces. The fear is reborn in the woman and in her babies by law. The law of karma, the law of cause and effect, and these were the tools used to do it. If a slave wanted to eat, they would put this mask on his head to keep him from eating, they would starve him. And those hooks around his neck would catch in the trees if he tried to run away. So if you wanted to 
eat, they would starve you. The tool on your right is to force feed you. So if you wanted to starve yourself to death, they would feed you. So if you wanted to live, they would make you die. And if you wanted to die, they would make you live. Think about what kind of people you were dealing with, especially consider the fact that you committed no crime. No crime, except that you wanted, it was a people who they wanted you to worship them. So this is what they did. The woman and the man, the European woman and the European man would kidnap slaves and sell them back. Colored people, kidnapping slave catches for money. Snatch your baby from under your bed and sell him. That's why they call it the crucifixion in stone. Speaking loud when you understand the handwriting of the gods. This is what they did. It's the only way to show it. They shot your husbands when they was in the water swimming, according to their art and their pen, speaking to you. They sh beat the old man, 89 years old, 80 or 90 years old, who could not defend himself. They beat him to the ground in front of his kids. They shot the, the son in front of his family. This is their pen. This book tells you much of that 100 years of lynching, telling you more than 5,000 newspaper articles on black people who was lynched. A colored woman hanged in Oklahoma. This is just telling you some of the stories. Negro youth mutilated for kissing white girl. They chopped off his penis and kept it for a silver nail. That's what they did. Negroes taken from jail and riddled with bullets. The black man, the black woman, the black child, nobody was safe. 24 hour a day. Silver nails. See, for the Negroes anatomy, they cut off his penis, his hands, his legs, and sold them as prizes, trophies. Is lynched by orderly mobs suspecting of killing a cow who they favored over the human being. A mule thief is hung who they favored over the black man. They would kill you for stealing chickens and hang you in South Carolina. This is just the last hundred years. Imagine what took place 300 years earlier. They say 70% of the hangings, there was no, no crime even suspected. They would just grab you off the street and do this. Live and in living color. This is the people. This is your history that you tried to avoid in Baruba Dog. They show it like this. They show you being put to the fire. Did you know that? The white man used to burn you at the stake. And the tradition is in Asia where you see the Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire as the ultimate form of pain, the ultimate form of sacrifice which the black people of America had to endure. This is a tradition to remind you when that day comes, what they did to you. Standing around taking pictures and laughing. This was a joyous occasion, mind you. This was no sad occasion. They took souvenir pictures. There it is in Asia on the right and in America on the left. The traditions of the Africans of Asia. And the inflict of pain, smiling, proud of what he did. It's all crowd when you burn a black man. They all want to see and cheer as he burns. This is according to their hand. They had to push back the crowd at the burning of this innocent black man of anything worth being set on fire for. But this is the tradition of the American way. See, they would hang you, burn you, and shoot you at the same time from their hands bearing witness against them. See, they would shoot you running, they would shoot you on the ground and beat you, and they would stomp you at the same time. <laughs> they would work your babies and your mama in the cotton fields for nothing. See, this is how they showed it in stone. The whole family on the plantation in this city in Southeast Asia. They would show the man taking the place of a mule, pulling the plow while his wife guides it. The man is pulling the plow. You see, and they would show you in stone the work that the entire family of the diaspora was forced to endure in this beast with two horns, North America and South America, primarily the United States of America, where this history is carved in this history of the country. It's inseparable. No free labor for 400 years in stone. The rock, the historian stone, the rock shall speak, yeah, he shall make the rock speak. 
While you worked, you were beaten. While you played, you were beaten. You lived in fear. Here it is. Yay. The rock shall speak to them. The rock shall tell the story. Yeah. In silence, the rock screams out. Yeah, they hung us from trees. Who else has a history like this? And you want to call it a lie. You want to call the handwriting of God a lie. You didn't know, did you? Yes, you did. You tried to forget. Once again, this was a festive occasion. They would take pictures and show it to their babies and their family how they killed the nigger for nothing and saved the cow. Even the governor would commend them in Augusta, Georgia for the, the lynching well done or the burning well done, teaching the niggas the fear that their forefathers put in the Constitution. They had to keep fear. Here's a Rodney King. A hundred years ago, here it is kicking and stomping this black man to death or damn near dead. This is what they did. And here's what they did the other day in L.A. It's the same people doing the same thing all the time. And here it is in stone. Hollering at you. Yeah, he gonna make the stone speak. Understand the esoteric teachings. The secret teachings. They catch the slaves and they inflict the pain. They inflict the fear of God in them, which they refer to as the crucifixion. Fear is something you live with all the time. Once it's inflicted on you, and they made it their business to continue it. The crucifixion of the Christ. The infliction of pain, the suffering of the Christ. If you really want to know what, who these people were, here's what they ate. They ate the whole hog, as you see them putting the whole hog in, in, in the pot there. That means they ate hog maw, hog head, and hog jaw. They ate pig feet, pig ears, and pig knuckles, chitlins, fat back, ham hocks, pork chops, pork skins. They ate everything pork. They ate the whole hog. Who else puts this description? They even ate pork and beans. There's your beans. Pork and beans, y'all. Yeah. Testify against them. That's what they did. You're the only people on the planet who eat that much pig. The whole hog. The law of attraction is another name for the law of polarity. It involves sex, magnetism, radiation, lotus, color, chemical affinity, and various other things. But this law identifies the effects of the wicked treatment that the black people receive how it affected the association, form building, adaptation of life, form, and group unity. The first effect is that it subconsciously made them worship the white image or the white face or that which is close to whiteness. The brain is like a computer. It interprets and translates that which is fed into it from the eyes and the ears and other senses. Through the use of the science of fear, the African-American brain was conditioned and pre-programmed to process information negatively. Subconsciously, it was taught to do what the European told it to do. And through the use of fear and lies, they achieved their objective and the subliminal worship by the African-American of the white man and his image. The code of conduct of the white man was written down in this catalog by their founding fathers of exactly how they should treat the black man and they follow it right up to this very moment. They are not going to let their ancestors down. The method of rulership through fear is tried and true. The Kundalini, the power of life as it is known in Asia, it's one of the forces of nature and it's viewed as a female energy that lays dormant or asleep at the base of the spine. And through a special practice of what they refer to as Kundalini Yoga, this female energy symbolized as a nega or a serpent can be awakened, you see, and it generates that power within the human being or within the male of the species that is necessary for spiritual development, which is known as union with God. The slave master, using fear, stole the Africans Americans' natural female energy. He is now una unable to express himself spiritually, symbolized here by the genie.
the conqueror because he cannot awaken his spiritual energy within himself and achieve that union with God. Once the Kundalini is awakening, awakened, it's considered to be the highest spiritual advancement symbolized here by the genie or genius who can awaken his own Kundalini. Power, the fear of death. This is the book the master gave the slave. Death put limitations on you. You set patterns in your life. At 40 years old, I'll do this. At 60 years old, I'll do that. And then I'll die. You limit your life. You limit your achievement by the belief in death. And they show you that only the Christ comes back from the death. This is what they gave to the slave. A belief in limitations on the mind. He was taught that Christ died for his sins. The African American has been tricked into believing that he can commit any crime, murder included, and that if he only asks the Lord for forgiveness, he will automatically be forgiven. Let me give you the real truth. The Lord heareth not the prayers of the wicked. The Lord heareth not the prayers of the wicked. There is no man living or that ever lived who can violate the laws of nature with impunity. It's only your deeds that save you. Your good deeds must equal your bad deeds. You reap what you sow. You pay for what you do. You pay, not Jesus Christ. Nobody can pay for your sins but you. Here, in this picture, the pen reinforces that belief that you can do what you want, this church scene, and be forgiven. Here, the stone speaks of the same testimony. The stone and the pen testifying to that same truth, the belief that you can get away with all your wickedness in the church. You got to reap what you sow. Here, that same wicked teaching in this, what they call a contraband, contraband meeting. It's contraband because there's no white people there teaching you the same thing. Go out and commit any crime. Go ahead and do it. You'll be forgiven. And here it is in stone, speaking loud. The pen and the stone. Yea, the pen and the stone shall bear witness. A thousands and thousands of years ago, teaching that same teaching. Here's how the black man learned of the Bible. With the white presence in the church, the white family, the white father, making sure that he got every lie correct, generating that image of love and compassion for black people on Sunday. But on Monday morning, they would turn around and get your children in school and teach them the science of being underachievers. They wrote all the books in order to guarantee your children's miseducation. They were taught to idolize European intelligence and education and that they come from an uncultured, primitive people. They would make images of themselves uh, of loving kindness and symbols and art. And then when the children came out on the street, that same fear became real. The reality came home. This man, on one hand, loved them. On the other hand, he hung their families and beat their babies and terrorized their mothers. This is how confusion, disagreement, and arguments became a natural part of the African-American culture. This was the science that was put on him from the slave master. Then they took their little babies and little girls and put them to work. Little girls and boys under 10 years of age are sent to chain gangs, according to what they say they did. Hard work and low wages, the African-American went to work for America in the building of America, as we see here, as the stone speaks from this city buried in the jungle in Southeast Asia. He went to work and he did everything he could, which is shown here in stone by his juggling, doing whatever he can, catch as catch can. This is the history. His first big job was fighting for the slave master. He got the highest pay and he got great respect and he got a gun. The slave master pointing, kill the enemy, the Vietnamese, the Korean, the Japanese in the city of Stone in Southeast Asia. We see the identical response. American history gives its applause to this stone city. This stone city did it first. They wrote it in stone. And it speaks from the pen and from the rock. Get your enemies sick like a dog. 
he got his jobs working on the railroad as a servant, which is his number two position, as we see here in stone. He served in all the kitchens, all the hotels, on the trains, and he shined their shoes, which the gods of Southeast Asia knew before it happened. Oh yeah, his third job, which he is most famous for, he's a musician. He can dance, his woman can dance, and sing. Music became their industry, as we see here, from the rock. And the rock hollers loud, Mr. Bojangles. There it is in stone from Southeast Asia in the city buried in the jungle. Oh, and they had those New Orleans marching bands, too, that the Africans of Asia knew about in advance. They showed them with their marching bands and their horns and their djembe, African drum, to show what people it was. And, of course, the African talking drum speaks for itself from the rock in a city buried in the jungle for thousands and thousands of years. Oh, they told him, hey, you want a white woman. Then they told him, you look and you come from the gorilla. What effect did it have when little black girls were depicted as, as ugly at every turn with picking any hair? When they came out with motion pictures and they depicted whiteness as beauty. In one popular movie, they made it real clear. They said, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, you can stick around. But if you're black, homeboy, get back. They not only delivered this message with images, but they, just, they delivered the message with words, showing you and telling you what beauty was. He handsome. Lonzo Tucker, ain't he handsome? They intentionally divided the various shades of black people against each other, and they took it to the top of your head, right to your hair. In the movies, one of y'all got good hair, the other one got nappy hair, and y'all sit up there like fools arguing with each other. Mm, mm, mm. Every time you saw a movie, a black was a slave, a nanny, or he was picking cotton, looking stupid. That was the image that was given to all little children. The black female was taking care of the white woman's baby. What effect did this have when you saw your father? Every, at every turn carrying a bucket and a mop. This was the images that was put before your babies. What effect did this have on the mind? According to the laws of cause and effect, the signs were up all over the country. No colored hair, no niggas and dogs hair. Don't drink at this water fountain. Don't walk in this doorway. Don't eat at this lunch counter. Don't wash your clothes here. Don't do nothing white because you are not worthy of standing next or being near the white ones. You're nothing. You're black and you're ugly. What effect did this have on the minds of your babies? When they first learned how to read and they saw this, what effect did they have? The European knew what to do. He knew how to destroy the mind and make a slave because the mind tells the eyes and the ear. And the black man suffered because of the science and so did the black woman. They went through physical and mental anguish all the days of their life. This is America. That's why they say the black man and woman of America was crucified. The stone speaks. The stone will tell you loud and clear if you can read the handwriting of the gods. They crucified the black man and woman of America in every way, externally and internally. And they use the science. Oh yeah, they focus. Oh, your own people sold you into slavery. They focus on that. Slave master bought you from a black man. They made the black man beat you, according to their document, so that you would be, wouldn't be mad at the slave master. You'd be mad at the man with the whip. They had a specific mode of beating slaves. They would have two blacks hold them in the front, one black hold them in the back, and, and another black beat them under the instructions of the white man. The slave who is receiving this beating is angry at the blacks who are beating him. This is reborn. This is what they did intentionally to make you hate each other, and this is reborn and it's depicted here, the effects. These are not two gladiators. This is brother against brother in stone. Notice they look exactly alike. This is what the gods of Asia were telling you. The effects were brother against brother, which is in our culture. The white woman spying on the Negroes working. There they are. They snitching on each other. They got fights. 
with each other. That's the effect of slavery. They gambled with each other, stole each other's money, tried to take each other's money, they became enemies of each other. That's the effects of slavery. Stealing from each other, which is endemic in our culture. One brother would get mad in stone here, you see him solving the problem. Killing you, cracking you on the head with a baseball bat in stone. The stone is screaming, telling you exactly the effects of slavery. Here we are in jail, in Southeast Asia, in a city, in the jungle. We occupy the jails all over the country. We fill them up in stone. We started drinking, taking alcohol. These are the effects of slavery. And today you find us all over America doing what we have been doing for the last 400 years. For survival. This is the man who did it. He wears leopard skin from the Indus Valley because a leopard is the only animal that will attack a human being without provocation. The stone speaks without provocation. That's what this is text. This is a wall carving showing you everything you just saw. Almost everything. to the history of that people and the Buddha who would appear in one of the 50 towers at that time at the end of the cycle at the end of the age to confirm life after death and divine intervention this is the way of the Africans of Asia they let you do it and then they show you in a book of stone what you did way of the gods. At the entrance, they show you the righteous gods on the right, the wicked gods on the left, and in the center, the future Buddha, who represents divine intervention. The, uh, these are the demons. The previous uh, illustration showed you the gods, and they're holding a serpent. This shows you both forces, the good and the evil, and divine intervention, the future Buddha, appearing at a certain point in time. And this is the city of the future Buddha with 50 towers. Each tower has either nine floors or seven terraces. And in the Buddhist scripture, they tell you that it will appear a stupa is a temple. And this temple that appears at the end of the cycle to confirm the teachings of the black people of Asia will give its applause. It will confirm and bear witness to that which you have just seen. Now in closing, the word nega is a very profound word. It represents, is represented by the serpent, and the serpent or a snakes can be found throughout this city, buried in the jungle. The serpent was the symbol of the black people of the world. Why? Because a serpent or a snake changes its skin. That means it doesn't have a standard body that it stays in. It lives, it dies, and it comes back. When, you, when a serpent changes his skin, it's symbolic meaning. It means that he changes bodies, but he never dies. So that's why the serpent is the symbol. It's a symbol of immortality, of not dying, of changing bodies, but never actually dying physically. That's why the serpent is buried throughout this city to show you uh, that the Africans of Asia proved life after death. And we can find a clear definition that is well known in this book, put out by the Theosophical Society, uh, identifying various terms. Now, I'm going to read from this book. There you see it right on the screen. I'm going to meet, tell you exactly what it means. Literally, serpent, the name in the Indian pantheon of the serpent or dragon spirits and the inhabitants of Patala, hell. These niggas are in hell. But Patala means antipods and was the name given to America. Now, these are some niggas in hell in America, given to America by the ancients who knew and visited that continent before Europe ever heard of it. This term is probably akin to the Mexican Nagals, and they have them as the Nats in Burma. And the esoteric term is represented by the dragon in China and Tibet, and it's various uh, old countries all over the world. In South Central America, they're called Nagas or Nagal. It's known all over the world. It's widespread. It's associated with cosmic forces, with celestial gods, with the constellations, with astrology. The nega, the serpent, is the identifying symbol of your ancestors because they never died and they had a way of proving it. All you have to do is look at the ancient ruins all over the world, the ancient temples, the ancient symbols of divinity from China to, 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 to any place you go. 
right here. It's the wisdom. They were identified with wisdom and with death and rebirth and resurrection. They were uh, identified with the resurrection of the dead, of proving life after death. That's why the serpent is, uh, changes its skin. And it was the symbol that your ancestors live, die, and come back. And you could go to North, Central, or South America. Before the uh, uh, conquistadors came, these were the pyramid temples with the serpent. The nigga outside now, step pyramids, the same principles used all over the world, you will find all over the world, and the serpent is present in each one of them. The nigga. In all ancient traditions, in Asia, the nigga sits on a serpent, symbolized by the black man, the Africans of Asia, seven cosmic forces protecting him. In Asia, and you will find the same principal teachings in ancient Egypt, if the Egyptologists would just evaluate this for a minute, they see it's the same people doing the same thing. Now the question arises, why does an immortal savior type figure arise among the Negro? And that is because the Negro doesn't realize this, but he has been conditioned to go to hell. He and most people on the planet Earth has been conditioned through Hellenism to go to hell. Black people must understand that 4,000 years ago, the slave master, was slave master was busy falsifying the religious teachings of the people of Asia. He single-handedly rewrote the entire Hindu religion of one billion people of India, and he handed distorted teachings to all the people of Asia. As uh, late as 2,000 years ago, they stepped up their religious brainwashing of the people of the earth. They went from Europe through Asia and back. They carved the path of death, destruction, by establishing a false teaching throughout the world, which still stands today. Hellenism, perpetrated by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was known and became great for his murder and killing and destruction of everything black that stood in his way. He burned and looted all that was in his path. Without earth movement equipment, he tore down the, 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 the great multi-storied religious structures spoken about in Deuteronomy and Kings as high places, built by the original man, the Asiatic black man, which showed nine floors and seven terraces. Uh, these conquistadors did the same thing, Pizarro and Cortez, when they went through North and South America, bringing the Hellenist doctrine, a doctrine that would put the people of the planet Earth in hell. This is what Alexander the Great is famous for, for murdering and killing and establishing a false religious doctrine throughout the earth to put the people of the planet earth in hell. They burned and looted all the religious scriptures that was in their way. Their primary objective was to destroy all religious teachings and to establish a false teaching that would send all future generations to hell. To hell with them, of course. This was the primary objective of the Hellenists. They knew they were going to hell, so therefore they set up a system of murder and killing to hide the teachings of God so that everyone on earth would go to hell with them. And the Negro, the American Negro, is their number one symbol. He took the brunt of all the false teachings of the enemies of God. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Their objective to send the people of the planet earth to hell. The Negro is supposed to lead the way. This document shows that Alexander the Great ran clean through Asia Minor. Alexandria, Egypt is named after Alexander the Great. He messed up and destroyed the true teachings of the Buddhist books, the Pali Buddhism. He set up a semi-Hellenistic culture throughout Northwest India. He made the Buddha statues to look like they were Greek instead of black. He went through Syria, through Saudi Arabia, destroying, changing the architecture, the science, and the art into a Hellenist appearing doctrine. He affected all the religious teachings. He went through India. Alexander went through the entire planet Earth, if not him himself personally. The doctrine of Hellenism is now pervades throughout the planet Earth, and you can see here by this map, this ancient map of Asia. It shows with the swastika, which was the symbol of the Hellenists. The swastika and the cross shows you their influence. Ethiopia, which was called Hither India. It was part of Asia at that time. They separated it from Asia. And they show you the cross, where you see the cross and the swastika is where the Aryan doctrine, the Hellenist doctrine, the doctrine to send people to hell, where they were influenced. 
where they had the strongest influence on the planet Earth. They were able to destroy all the true teachings. There's no one who has the 100% true teachings that's able to come out with the true teachings on the planet Earth today because they have a penalty of death for them. This is further India, Cambodia, Sambo, Judasia, the land of the descendants of Sambo, the original man. You see the swastika, the Asian uh, religious teachings has always been under attack. The European Hellenists went from one part of the Earth to the other with the primary objective of sending the people of Earth to hell. The Hellenist swastika, that's what that means. They have the cross too for Christianity, the distorted teachings. This was started 4,000 years ago. This map is from 2,000 years ago. This book called the Book of God, I will explain to you uh, what this book is about a little later. But right now, I just want to show you that what's in this book. It says the plain truth is that not a single sacred volume of the past is free from corruption. This book is explaining to you that all the religious documents in the West are corrupted. The Emperor Nero, they murdered his mother for divulging the secrets. It's punishable by death to speak of the true teachings of God. It killed Nero's mother for doing it. It's punishable by death to teach the Negro, uh, the American, the Afro-American, anything of the truth of God. To disclose this would be punishable by death. There is a contract out for teaching the true teachings of God. The Negro does not know this. The people of the present are ignorant like the people of the past. This book explains to you how they set up death as a penalty for teaching the truth. Death was the punishment, and the priests, the head of the church, were the murderers. They would kill you. It was the, they had a vested interest in teaching all the people lies about God. And the priests were the number one murderers. The Negro doesn't know this. The apocalypse, the revelation, was death to divulge. Now, this was 4,000 years ago, and then as late as Alexander, which was 2,000 years ago, the Messiah... The Negro was looking up in the air for somebody to come down with wings. They say here the Messiah is just a savior. He's a man in all respects, not free from human error. However, his doctrine is the doctrine of God. But he's a human being like everybody else, and he makes mistakes like everybody else. You can't tell your Christian this. He's looking for Jesus Christ to come down on a cloud. This is the position that they put his mentality in. Tell us. This is why this stone sculpture speaks loud and clear about the Negro's mentality. He has a robot mentality. He does whatever the white man says. He doesn't realize that he's been brainwashed. This is the fisherman of Nineveh, Noah's Ark. He's on a boat. This is Jonah trying to catch the Negro to pull him out of the mental destruction that he's in. He's on his way to hell, but he does not know it. That's the Messiah with the net trying to catch the Negro. The Negro is on his way as a robot going to hell like a Frankenstein monster, but he does not know it. This is in stone. Look in your dictionary. This is an Oxford dictionary that Europeans use. White people use this dictionary. Look in the Negro dictionary that you have in your house and see if you find this word, Helen. Helen is the root word of Hellenist. Now look at the meaning of the word Helen, which they will not put in your dictionary. It says, of or belonging to hell. Helen is the root word of Hellenism. It's infernal. It's hellish. That's the meaning of the word Helen. If this word Helen means belonging to hell, then Hellenist or Hellenism is a practitioner of putting you in hell. That's what the Hellenist culture is about in this country. Belonging to hell. Helene, a word that says the name applied to themselves. They call themselves this by all Greeks. It eventually spread to, 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 to Italy and throughout Europe. They call themselves Hellenists. Because, why? Because their principal objective was to send the people of the planet Earth with their culture to hell. The Negro is to lead the way as proof by the Emancipation Proclamation, as you see here the ultimate form of proof. Now you have to remember when evaluating this document that the Negro slave could not read. He was not allowed to read up until his freedom when this proclamation was uh, uh, created. If he was caught reading, he was killed on the spot. So he had to read the symbols on this proclamation. This is how he read, by symbols. Slave master made pictures for the Negro because if the Negro could read, he would get killed. So the Negro didn't read the words of the proclamation. The symbols is what he read. 
symbols and pictures and images have always been the Bible of the ignorant. We must. And you can see with the Emancipation Proclamation that the slave master fooled the Negro with symbols and images just like they do today with television and the movies. Now let's look at this document through the slave's eyes and see what Honest Abe really did for the Negro. Now, as you saw by the wicked treatment of the slave master and the spirituals the Negroes sang, that anyone who freed him would be viewed, in his eyes, as God. This was his strongest belief. Now, what does this symbol tell the Negro? He tell him that a white angel, who he viewed as God, freed him. This is what Honest Abe told the Negro to, to believe. Honest Abe falsely told the Negro he would be happy and free, as that shows you right here. Again, Honest Abe tells the Negro to take your babies and make them love this white angel that freed you. This is the message to the illiterate slave. Honest Abe tells the Negro that he's going to get paid money. He never got paid during slavery. That was free. Honest Abe told the Negro with this picture he's going to have a beautiful home. The Negro was living in a shack at the time. With this picture, Honest Abe reminds the Negro that he's the one that gave him salvation, that they should pray to Honest Abe. This is what the illiterate slave saw. He told the slave that his children would get a wonderful education. That's what he promised the slave. That's the way the enslaved interpreted it. But he told the slave, you're going to still be working for master. Now, he wasn't going to lie about that. You got to work for master. And he reminds the Negro again to teach your babies to love the one who freed you. That's God in the slave's mind. This is the symbol of the 40 acres and a mule, which you never got. Now, let me see if I can unlock your mind when you see this picture. Notice the devil has chains. Why? because the slave master knew that he is the devil. But he changed his appearance, and the Negro's brain was so devastated he couldn't figure this simple one out. The slave master was setting you free because he achieves his objective. And of the objective of slavery was to send all Negroes in future generations to hell. You couldn't see it in 1865, but you could see it right now. The nigger, the serpent. They associated him with the, with, the, with the devil to make you think the serpent was evil. But that's you. N-A-G-H. The Africans of Asia, the serpent gods. That's who you are. And that's who they show on the Emancipation Proclamation that was in slavery. But your mind was locked. And this is the serpent, the dragon, the nigger in Asia. The same symbolism. He knew it all the time. In ancient Egypt, these are the people they're talking about. You, the nigger. They program you to go to hell, the divine tribe, the divine people who would be enslaved in hell in America, the nigger, the serpent gods, your ancestors, were enslaved, their people in America, and it's on the Emancipation Proclamation. You couldn't read it in 1865, but you can see it right now. Look at it. A 1993 slave could read this one. This is the teachings small portions of the Africans of Asia, but let me move on. The symbols on the Emancipation Proclamation tells you what the Negro agreed to. His mind was already devastated. That's his, sanction, his sacred sanctuary is the mind. He agreed to, 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 to submit completely to the white God and white belief because he couldn't read nothing. Nothing here could he read. So he agreed to go to hell unknowingly by following this image symbolism that's on the Emancipation Proclamation. The slave didn't know it, but he made a pact with the devil to go to hell. More than 4,000 years after the truth has been devoured, here comes the Negro on his way to hell, and he's not walking, homeboy, he's jogging. In order to stop him from going to hell, his ancestors now intervene. They intervene by sending the future Buddha, or a future human being among their own kind who is enlightened. They refer to him in Asia as the Buddha. This is the way his ancestors intervene to awaken him to that which the slave master has done to him, which he does not know. And this one who comes teaches him the truth. That's why they call the Buddha the liberator of the niggas. The liberator. This is in this book, The Gods of Northern Buddhism. They call the Buddha as liberator of the serpents. See, he comes to liberate, to give salvation, liberator of the niggas. Powerful king of the niggas. The Buddha appears to liberate you, to save you from going to hell. This is why they say the Buddha is the liberator of the niggas.
Once again, the liberator of the niggas. They were bred to attack the Buddha when he appears to do something beneficial for black people. That was the breeding of the nigger during slavery. So since the Negro wants to attack, I want to show you the way of the gods. He's been conditioned to attack. First, they write the future again. Then they let the future happen. Then they send back one from the dead who explains it to you. And then they execute judgment. They put the wicked in a lake of fire. The attackers go into a lake of fire. They punish the wicked. Now here's a temple, one of the greatest religious monuments on earth that sits between four volcanoes in Indonesia. It's called Barubador. And Barubador has a secret I wish to explain to the attacking people, those who like to attack the one who brings the truth. This temple shows the same story of the Negro, but they show it in more graphic detail. Here's the Negro on Friday night, chilling with his woman, smoking reefers, cocaine. The facial expression shows the dope, the dope mass. They write it in stone thousands of years before it happened. And then they show it to you, smoking joints, taking dope, smoking crack, all in stone in Asia, in Barubador. Here they are on Friday night, high, chilling with their woman, clapping their hands, jamming, doing the latest dance, and playing their saxophone, written in stone, thousands of years before it happened. Could this be a Chinese, a Japanese, or a Mexican? No, home slice. This is the black man of America with his saxophone, and the identifying location is the ghetto. And it's Friday night. Make no mistake about it. They knew you before you knew yourself. But the objective is to show you that you are not to attack anyone who brings you truth. Here they show the future Buddha in this same temple being attacked, not for doing anything wrong, except for speaking the truth of the history of the black people of America. They have the fate of those who attack. Words and verbal confrontation is beautiful. Physical violence gets you uh, the lake of fire, as they explain it, and it is shown here in this same temple that showed you the saxophone, shows you the fate of those who attack, because the black people of America has been programmed and bred to attack their own kind first. Don't do it no more. This temple speaks loud and clear. You don't want to do that to the one who brings you the truth. You want to sit back and talk. And this is in stone. Also, in Tibet, they show you that same stone punishment in the sacred Mandela. This is Mahakala, the god of pain. And it shows you how they punish those who attack. The Buddha, the future Buddha, is on the outside. He's not subjected to all of that. But he shows you what happens to the program, anybody of any race who attacks the truth when it comes at the end of the cycle. He winds up in this vessel here, referred to as the lake of fire. Physical violence. Forget it, man. Don't even, don't, just forget it. I want to show it to you in stone and on paper. This is the, the Tibetan wheel of life. It's known all over Asia. This is the fate of those who want to attack the truth at the end of the age, at the beginning of the new age. Your ancestors refer to this, this is turning the wheel of the law. And the name of the one who comes back to turn the wheel of the law is called Nigga Junior or Nigga Juna. He explains the secret teachings of the Africans of Asia. The wheel of the law is the teaching that there is no death, that life is eternal, and his job is to prove that. Many sacred places are named throughout Asia with the name Nigga Saki. Nagasaki, Nagajuna Kanda, that means the hill of Nagajuna. When he appears, he'll be living on a hill. He'll be across from an island like Manhattan, living in a tower, which they refer to as a monastery. This is called Nagajuna Kanda, the hill of Nagajuna, which is across from an island. You see, he's also known as Nagajuni. He is the one commissioned to do that work for the Africans of Asia. Now, you might be asking yourself, how did, how did he receive all this information? This, is, this book here is The Gods of Northern Buddhism, and I'm going to read to you the story of Nigajuni or Nigajuna. Just follow the yellow as I read. 
It says he received the Jirtis on which he expounded and developed the Mahayana school from the serpent gods, the Niggas, and that the Nigga king himself revealed to Nigga Juna the holy text in the dragon palace under the sea. That's like America. They further claim that Gautama Buddha, the Buddha, had given this treatise called the Prajna Paramita to the Niggas to God until such a time, it's a specific time now, as the world should become sufficiently enlightened to understand its transcendent wisdom. And that the Niggas, after converting this individual, Nigga Juni, to Buddhism, handed over to him their precious treasure. Now let's take a look at what the precious treasure is. It's on the bottom line. They said they handed over to him their precious treasure. The precious treasure is the evidence and the proof of life after death. That's the bottom line. They refer to this as their precious treasure because it's the only thing that God wants to hear at this point in time. It's the only thing in the world that they preach. Praying, stomping, testify means nothing. It's the teaching of life after death, and this is God's gift to the Negro. God has decided to give this to the Negro to make the Negro his appointed people, and you see in the sacred temple of Barubadar, the only thing that the Buddha images do there is preach this precious treasure, the proof of eternal life. In this nine-floor uh, greatest religious monument on earth, the top three floors show the bell, for whom the bell tolls. Now let me tell you what the bell means in all the religions of the earth. The bell is a symbol of the connection between God and man in all religions. As you see here, in every nook and cranny, in all the little windows you see, and this particular uh, pictorial diagram of Barudor, you see the Buddha in the bell preaching the law. This is a side view. This is another side view pictorial diagram. Show all the Buddha images preaching the law. This is the precious treasure. This is the only thing they want to hear at the end of the cycle is the law, the law of God. And this is the Bell Pyramid. In the Buddhist scriptures, the Saddam Pandarika, they call it the Lotus of the True Law. This is the true law of God. It's the only thing that gets you out of hell at this time. There are more than 500 images of the Buddha. This is inside the bell. Inside each bell, the Buddha preaches the law. The symbol of the bell also means that the God is calling you to obedience, to bear witness to the divine law, to bear witness to God. That's what this bell means. The ringing of the bell is saying, hey, get down on your knees and pray. This is the last one. This is the big one. It's the only thing that the gods want to hear at this time. Here we see the Buddha, a symbolism of the Buddha preaching this precious treasure, the proof of eternal life, and the Buddhists from thousands of years ago in all worlds and every universe get up and bear witness at the end of the cycle, the living and the dead. The souls bear witness to this teaching of this precious treasure, the law. The preaching of this law is the only thing that gets you out of hell. They say it is the fruit of meritorious action, just a remembering, teaching, and explaining it to others so they can understand it. They say that any place that you preach this should be worshipped as a shrine. They say the value of this is incomparable. There's nothing to compare with preaching this law at the end of the cycle. They say that this preaching is of incomparable measure. You can't, the mind cannot conceive how much this is worth. You could give a billion, trillion dollars away to the poor, wouldn't be worth an inch of this law. This is the only way to get out. They say if you receive it, write it down, memorize it, teach it to others so they can understand it, it's incomparable. They call it the Diamond Sutra, the Thunderbolt, the Vajra, the manifestation of God. The Thunderbolt, the Diamond Sutra. It comes to the chosen people of God at the end of the cycle. The Buddha gives this to the niggas to hold until such a time that the world is ready for it, the niggas give this religious teaching to nigga Juna, and nigga Juna turns it over to the black people of America, the Negro. What does that mean? That means that the black people of America are the ones chosen by God to provide to the world the proof of the resurrection of the dead. What? But I don't want to confuse the Negro because his brain might lock on this one. But the resurrection of the dead is also the execution of judgment. Only the Christ can execute judgment on his return. Now let the Negro follow me one more time. He has been chosen by God to show to the world the resurrection of the dead. Now Jesus Christ, let's look at the meaning here. The word Jesus means savior. The word Christ means anointed. 
So Jesus Christ just means anointed Savior. It's a title for the Messiah. It's a title for one or people commissioned by God for a specific task. This is the image that the Negro has of the anointed Savior, the European on the cross. This is the depiction of the Africans of Asia showing the crucifixion of the black people of America, the black man and the black woman being crucified. Which one will you choose? The black man and the black woman of America is the true Christ carved in stone thousands of years before it ever happened. So as a reward for their 400 years plus of torment at the hands of the brutal slave master, the God of the universe awards the Negro, the righteous Negro, with eternal life by providing that evidence of the resurrection of the dead. He promised the Negro eternal life in the paradise of the gods, and this is what the righteous Negro gets. You have to meditate for a while on this one. Because God wants the Negro to preach this sermon.